Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. There's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple. This is iMac. The whole thing is translucent. You can see into it. It's so cool. <laughs> this amazing little device holds a thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Are you getting it? Well, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. No, just kidding. Wrong number. Thank you. It's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our Extraordinarily pleased to uh, be able to be here with you. This is one of my uh, my personal uh, uh, <laughs> one of my personal personal uh, hopes and wishes. Actually, is that I think that computers can radically revolutionize the educational process around the world and. Uh, the average age at Apple, as you know, is about 29 or 30, and uh, we haven't been out of college so long ourselves. At least most of the people at Apple haven't. And uh, it's very, very important to us. And I think that, you know, as you all know better than I, Europe is sort of a, doesn't exist. It was just a word invented for the convenience of Americans and, and others. And uh, the fact that you're all here in this room uh, as a step towards cooperating with each other uh, in new ways, uh, pleases me very much. It's uh, difficult enough to, uh, to get cooperation amongst uh, competitive universities in America, and uh, I think that that's great. Um, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to do? The, you can have many views of what a computer is. My particular view is that a computer is a new medium, a new medium, one of the media print, television, radio, and uh, a computer will in the future be looked at, I think, more in this way, as a delivery vehicle for software, just like a book is a delivery vehicle for its own kind of software. And uh, whenever we develop a new medium, we generally tend to fall back into our old habits from our old media. Uh, as an example, when the television first came of age in America, the first television shows were simply a camera pointed at a radio show. Uh, and it took about 20, 30 years for television to really come into its own in the late 1950s. Uh, we have this new medium of interactive video, 
because of the laser disc. And what is the first thing we do with it? Uh, we put movies on it. So again, we tend to fall back into our old habits. Um, in the same way, when the personal computer was invented, we tended to look at it as a smaller version of a big computer. So we put COBOL and FORTRAN and these bizarre things on it um, and looked at it in terms of simple economics rather than the revolutionary nature that it, it really was. Do you know who Alexander the Great's tutor was for about 14 years? You, you know, Aristotle. And I read this, I became immensely jealous. Uh, and I think I would have enjoyed that a great deal. <laughs> and and uh, through the miracle of the printed page, I can at least read what uh, Aristotle wrote without an intermediary. And uh, maybe if there's a professor, they can, they can add to that. But at least I can go directly to the source material. And that is, of course, the foundation upon which our Western civilization is built. But I can't ask Aristotle a question. I mean, I can, but I won't get an answer. And so <laughs> I, my hope is that in, in, in our lifetimes, we can make a tool of a new kind, of an interactive kind. And when I look at the personal computer, uh, we're, as you know, living in the wake of the last revolution, which, which was a new source of free energy. And that was the free energy of petrochemicals, right? And it completely transformed society. And we're products of this petrochemical revolution, which is, we're still living in the wake of today. We are now entering another revolution of free energy. Uh, and Macintosh, as you know, uses less power than a few of those light bulbs, and uh, yet can save us a few hours a day or give us a whole new experience. And it's free intellectual energy. It's crude, very crude. But it's getting more refined year after year after year. And in our lifetimes, it should get very refined. And so my hope is someday, when the next Aristotle is alive, we can capture the underlying worldview of that Aristotle in a computer. And someday, some student will be able to not only read the words Aristotle wrote, but ask Aristotle a question and get an answer. And uh, that's, that's what I hope that we can do. So this is a beginning. Um, I think that, as you know right now, the computer industry is in the, in the tank. Uh, personal computers, big computers, everything. And uh, it's difficult. It's a difficult time. But I'm sure that Henry Ford had a few bad quarters back in the 1920s. <laughs> And the automobile had a sort of historical imperative. It had, it, it, the minute it was invented, it, it, a sequence of events had to happen. The same is true with the personal computer. Uh, there is a, a, a tremendous momentum behind this. And I think that this year may be a delay. This year we may look back and say, well, 1985 was a slow year. But it, there is such momentum behind this that it will happen. It will permeate and change forever our educational processes. And my hope, again, is that not too many generations of students will pass through before this happens. Uh, it will happen within 20 years. It probably will happen within 10 years. But it could happen within five years. Good afternoon. Everyone's probably been sitting here for a long time, huh? Um, I just got here this afternoon, so I'm, my mind's somewhere over Iowa. But a few things. Uh, everyone here, I was told, is real bright. Is that true? <laughs> Plus, I want to meet Eric later on. Which one's Eric? Oh, hi, Eric. How you doing? Um, and uh, a lot of stuff here is rags to riches. I was listening back there. Sort of want to be careful about that, because... Um, there's a lot of people that have been real successful in other terms that aren't here because maybe they didn't make a lot of money that you want to listen to very carefully. And one of the things that, that tends to run through some of the things that people here have talked about is uh, innovation and creativity. And 
if you really brought, have you ever thought about what it is to be intelligent? Probably some of you have, right? Because you meet your friend and he's pretty dumb and maybe you think you're smarter and you wonder what the difference is. <laughs> and and I, I've thought about this a little bit myself and, and one of the things is, it seems to me a lot of it's the, a lot of it's memory, but a lot of it's the ability to sort of zoom out like you're in a city and you could look at the whole thing from about the 80th floor down at the city and while other people are trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B reading these stupid little maps, you can just see it all out in front of you. You can see the whole thing and you can make connections that just seem obvious because you can see the whole thing. That's why bright people feel guilty a lot because they come up with stuff that they just say, hey, look at this and other people give them these dumb awards and they feel funny. <laughs> um, But the key thing is that if you're going to make connections which are innovative, you, 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 to connect two experiences together, that you have to not have the same bag of experiences as everyone else does, or else you're going to make the same connections, and then you won't be innovative, and then nobody will give you an award. So what you've got to do <laughs> is get different experiences um, than, than the normal course of events. And one of the, the, the funny things about being bright is everyone puts you on this path. You know, to go to high school, go to college. I've heard about some kid that's 14 on his way to Stanford. And that's great. That's sort of out of the ordinary. Um, but you might want to think about going to Paris and being a poet for a few years, you know. Or you might want to go to a third world country. I'd highly advise that. And see people and lepers with their hands falling off and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's very much so worth doing. Um, you know, fall in love with two people at once. You know, you, Walt Disney took LSD. Do you know that? He did once, and that's where the idea for Fantasia came from. It's true, and you can go hear stories about all these people. And the key thing that comes through is that they had a variety of experiences which they could draw upon in order to try to solve a problem or attack a particular dilemma in a, in a kind of unique way. And so one of the things that you'll get a lot of pressure to do uh, is to go in one very clear direction and believe in God and all that other stuff. And that's great, but don't uh, ever walk by a Zen Buddhist because of that. Sit down and talk and buy him lunch. And <laughs> one of the, the things that, that I had um, um, in my mind growing up, I don't know how it got there, was, but that the world was sort of something that happened just outside your peepers. And you didn't, you didn't really try to change it, you just sort of tried to find your place in it and, and have the best life you could. And it would all just go on out there and there were some pretty bright people running it. And as you start to interact with some of these people, you find they're not a lot different than you. Um, the people actually making these decisions every day that are sort of running the world are, you, you know, are not really very much different than you. And they might have a little more uh, judgment in some areas, but basically they're the same. And once you realize that, you start to feel you have a responsibility to do something about it because the world's in, in pretty bad shape right now. And uh, I guess one of the things that motivates a lot of people that I've seen that, that actually get out and do something in, in any different field is that we all sort of uh, you know, eat food that other people cook and wear clothing that other people make and speak a language that other people evolved and use someone else's mathematics. And, and we're sort of taking from this giant pool constantly. And the, the most ecstatic thing in the whole world is actually put something back into that pool. And I think people from all the fields that maybe you've heard from here and, and a whole bunch that you haven't would express the same sort of feeling. It's the most ecstatic thing that I've encountered. So I would highly recommend it. Um, and one of the major areas, I know probably with all this stuff, I might not be invited back here next year, so I'll say it now. The, <laughs> when you pass a, a certain age, I don't know what it is, 25, 30 years old, uh, you sort of as a human being inherit the responsibility of being a guardian of the earth for future generations of which you are all a member uh, to inherit. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, but just obviously that's the case. And I think our particular, uh, our particular, this particular generation of people that is your guardian is doing an extremely poor job in one area, and one area where 
all of the help that you all can muster is really necessary. And that is that the chances that this planet's going to remain in one piece through your natural lifetimes is not extremely high right now. And it's fairly dismal. And uh, I anticipate having some kids one day and helping them grow up to be sane human beings. And you people are going to be the people that are running the planet when my kids grow up. So would you please pay attention to this problem and try to do something about it? Because I'd like to see my kids grow up and be able to come here and sit like you and listen to a bunch of funny people. Thank you. Software magnate number three. When, when was your first date with Macintosh? We've been working with the Mac uh, for almost two years now. And we put some of our, our really good people on it. Software CEO number three. Will Macintosh be the third industry standard? Well, to create a new standard, it takes something that's not just a little bit different. It takes something that's really new and really captures people's imagination.